Our secretary general is so busy with her cakes. Assalamu alaikum, Zaida, everyone. Did you ask me anything? Assalamu alaikum. No, no, no. I said it's a, you have a dual responsibility, the official and the home as well. You're busy with your kids. <laughs> yes, that's exactly. Yeah, uh, Zaida, uh, it's okay. Ready, YouTube and uh, Zoom Master is recorded now. Whenever you want, you can start. Have a good session. So I think we... Have Thank you so much. And I think it's uh, almost 2 p.m. So let's uh, start formally the session. Shall I start, Dr. Ali? Sure. You can start. Hello? Or you can wait can in a minute. Me? Or maybe. Or is yours? Oh, perfect, no problem. Okay. I hope all of our speakers are here. I couldn't find Nora Khalid uh, from Egypt. Halit is now on the Zoom. Okay, perfect. Yeah, I'm just checking out that we have all of our speakers uh, here. So, and Khalid is here. Mm, what about YouTube connection, Dr. Ali? Uh, both start, uh, no. uh, both, okay. both were started and it's recording now. Okay, okay. thank you. Thank you. So let's just start. I think all of our speakers are there right now. So let's begin the session formally. Uh, can I start, Dr. Ali? The floor is yours. Okay, thank you so much. So first of all, respected all, uh, welcome to the second session of International Com Conference of Museum 2021, Group 4, which is a joint initiative of ICOM Pakistan, 
Kumbh, ICOM, ICAMH, uh, International Committee for Museums and Collections of Archaeology and History, and ICOM Georgia. Uh, I hope uh, uh, you all are doing well, safe, and have done with your vaccinations, which is uh, indeed very necessary. Uh, we had a wonderful session on uh, 28th, uh, uh, a day before yesterday, regarding Museum and Sustainable Development Goals. Uh, by ICOM Georgia, and uh, today we are coming up with another important theme, Museums in Digital Age. Uh, the current digital revolution, or you can say a digital era that uh, began during COVID-19 pandemic, has created a domain of communication where museums reposition themselves and becoming more than physical place to visit. And uh, there are hundreds and thousands of challenges of uh, digital technology which museum and curators are tackling, and few of them uh, will be discussed in today's session. So this session is uh, designed with the collaboration of uh, ICOM International Committee, ICMH, and uh, the International Committee, uh, sorry, International Committee of ICOM, ICOM Pakistan. We are grateful uh, to the ICOM uh, ICMH for accepting our invitation, and we hope that the collaboration between the two will continue in the upcoming future as well. So without any further delay, we are moving forward to welcome our honorable, honorable keynote speaker, Madam uh, Burchek Marvan, the president of International Committee for Collection and Museums of Archaeology and History. She is an industrial designer and museumologist at uh, Tetrazon Design since 2005. She gives lecture in the field of art, museumology, museography, and design at various universities. She wrote uh, several articles on design, museum, and culture. So, ma'am, the floor is yours, please. Thank you very much, Saida. Thank you uh, for all for coming. Uh, I would like to uh, express my personal gratitude to Zahida to involve us uh, as ICMA uh, in these conferences. I think that uh, being very uh, inclusive, ICMA is dealing with all art and uh, uh, all art history, history and archaeology museums. And uh, we are very happy to follow uh, this session. Um, with you, we propose, ah, Santiago is here. I was saying that uh, in Santiago uh, is from ICMA and we'll moderate with Saida uh, the session for um, as our re representative. Uh, but Santiago is in Colombia and it's 4 a.m. in Colombia. So he's drinking his coffee uh, <laughs> to wake him up. <laughs> so um, I would like to uh, be very uh, brief and let the floor uh, to the very interesting presentations that we conceived all together. May I share my screen? Yes, please. I think it is visible now. Uh, yeah, but can we make it the full screen, please? Sure. Thank you. I'm doing it. Yes, um, for the behalf of uh, ICMA, I would like uh, to make a brief entrance to the conception and design of virtual exhibitions for uh, museums. Um, a virtual exhibition of a museum uh, is an online web-based presentation of its collections by theme, by a period, by topic, or by concept. The uh, early examples when uh, the World Wide Web uh, become more effective and used by, um, by all the world uh, the presentations of the museums in World Wide Web were mostly simple photographic lineups after a curatorial approach given by the explanation of text or, and where a brief information about the object has been labeled. The uh, idea of presenting the collections internationally was a kind of cataloging and uh, was a kind of presenting the inventory system. Uh, then the evolution and advent of new technologies make accessible several applications in the service of cultural heritage milieu, not only for the museums, but also 
for archives, for libraries, and for other cultural institutions, especially deal with art. Uh, the most uh, used space of these virtual exhibitions is, of course, uh, in the heart of the museums and in the heart of many art, archaeology, and history museums. The growing spread of internet and its use facilitated the access in the virtual world. Now we have all connections in all over the world to have access to uh, many information, which is called the metadata. Especially during uh, COVID period, uh, during pandemic, the virtual exp uh, exhibitions are spread uh, in all museums. And of course, our conferences on virtual worlds are spread and the number is highly augmented as well. Uh, at the beginning, the simple digital cataloging of the museum collections uh, then with these possibilities turned into a more attractive presentations where uh, collections are placed into virtual space and which can be manipulated. Here I take an example of the British Museum, British Museum's collection presentation in collaboration with uh, Google, uh, with Google, which is a worldwide uh, used program of, with uh, many possibilities. Uh, here you can see the uh, collection presentation with uh, exhibition with um, labeling without a defined space. Uh, it's on the space, uh, like if uh, which is lined up by a chronology. It is a chronological um, preference, but thematical or topical um, preferences can be used as well. And uh, we have many keywords to search the collections to have information about the collections. Uh, the idea is uh, make become the virtual exhibitions more interactive where uh, the online user can make uh, his or her choices. And the evolution of 3D technologies uh, helped to create imaginary museum spaces uh, where all online users become a new kind of visitors. These virtual exhibitions, uh, different from our real museums, can be visited all time from all over the world. Um, when we are talking about the virtualization of the collections, we also have to notice that uh, the creation of virtual realities in real museum spaces. Several museums, uh, including mostly history and archaeology museums, integrate digital installation in their real museums, where they create a virtual context to make sense um, and make a better comprehension for their collections uh, for their visitors. This is a double approach. We have two kinds of virtuality uh, in the real space of the museums and in the World Wide Web. Uh, if we want to talk about a typology, we can group into four this kind of exhibitions. The uh, first one, virtuality in museum exhibitions, virtual reality in museum exhibitions. This is a real space of museum where uh, the virtual reality uh, is realized to visualize the history which does not exist actually in relation with the Thames and collections of the museum. It means that uh, we are creating in the museum 
where um, the visitor uh, can enter into a kind of virtual interactivity and in which we are representing the concepts and the contexts that are no more visible in our actual world. So we are creating in a kind of scenery, in a kind of um, historical movie where the visitors can be uh, integrated, make his or her own choices to visit, to create a path. In the second part of the, typo, the typology, uh, this is very often used during the pandemic virtual exhibitions. This is the virtualization of, exist, of an existing temporary or permanent exhibitions. There are many softwares uh, to help to create this image on the web. We need a real exhibition in a real museum space where um, a photographic lineup is resembled by a specific software to create uh, interactive paths. Uh, and during all pandemic, many museums preferred this way to make continue their exhibitions uh, in live. And as far as you know, this kind of exhibitions can uh, took a lot of uh, place with several activities around. Uh, we can click on the defined places to uh, choose our path and we can have the explanations and we can have the uh, content of the objects or of the archives uh, as well as about the uh, general content of the museum. Some museums are even realized uh, guided visits in these virtual um, exhibitions. And uh, I'm sure that you follow this kind of uh, guided visits on YouTube or on Facebook or sometimes on Zoom. The third uh, typology uh, of virtual exhibitions uh, are the virtually designed exhibitions in real museum spaces. As far as the, especially this uh, elaborated during pandemic as well, because uh, when pandemic become longer and longer and the museums are closed and closed, museums uh, for their activity and not to lose their visitors, they organized uh, non-existing virtual exhibitions, but by using their uh, real spaces. In this case, a completely virtual conception and virtualized collections in 2D uh, photography or in 3D by modeling are placed in a museum model conceived after and with the real data. The fourth typology, which is uh, very often used and which is mostly used for um, art exhibitions, is a virtual exhibition in a completely virtual space, but with museum collections. Um, this is totally a reinvent, reinvention of space with 3D modeling of a, a conceived uh, space with walls or with floors, with other atmospheres, sometimes in the nature, sometimes uh, in a very um, carefully designed content. But uh, these exhibitions are also very much seen uh, during the pandemic. The creating, yeah, if we want to talk about the creating of virtual exhibitions, the conception of a virtual exhibition uh, follows quite similar path with preparing real exhibitions. We always have a curator or a curatorial team 
where um, they choose, we choose, if we are the curator, we choose uh, the objects and the theme, the uh, idea of what we want to give to the visitors and to the online users. Uh, we are choosing the series of our collections. We are labeling them. We are preparing explanation uh, information panels for uh, the terms or for specific object groups. Then uh, we create a virtual location for these collections. We are first uh, creating the lineup of the exhibition. It can be a chronological exhibition, a thematical exhibition. Then we are defining the need of space to make more visible um, and more easily manipulated for this um, virtual exhibition. Uh, in this location, we are defining my, this location. If we are creating um, completely re reinvented, we are uh, defining all kind of material, all kind of um, design that we will use as space. Uh, these choices are coming from the TEM definition. If we are talking about an archaeological site, we are trying to create the real uh, or look real uh, excavation area, or uh, we are uh, reconstructing in a kind this atmosphere to make it more visible and understandable for the visitors. Then there is a part of uh, normal production and mounting of the exhibition becomes uh, the part of 3D modeling and all media definition. There are existing softwares which can be adapted to make these virtual um, exhibitions, and there are many possible uh, there are many possibilities to integrate voice or videos or effects or um, different kind of visual and uh, audible uh, possibilities. So once the model is ready and the media definitions are done, uh, the media expert resembles all the information coming from the museum, all the curatorial information with this virtual space and uh, they are preparing a last render of the virtual exhibition. All the virtual exhibitions need um, a web domain to be integrated. And generally now uh, you can see in many museums, a kind of um, virtual, um, virtual place, virtual space or online exhibition space, which enrich also the communication with all over the world. Uh, all these virtual uh, realities can never, I think, replace our real museums, but they really help uh, to be more international, to be more aware about um, the activities of other museums. And I think in any way, this is an augmentation of our visitors and now of our users. So I would like to let the floor um, to the other speakers. They will give us very, very uh, interesting examples. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for the informative talk and uh, it's really very interesting even i forget to calculate the timings it's really very informative and uh, for the general audience if they have any questions please you can write in a chat box so we will add uh, later uh, in q and session at the end so up next i would like to uh, call our first speaker of the session Ms. Zenia nasser she is a conservation assistant at Aga Khan Cultural Service at Pakistan. Uh, she is a part of Lahore 14, focusing mainly on the conservation issues of the picture wall, as well as other component of Lahore Forge. So she will share with us uh, uh, that how a mural painting can be a museum. 
So Xenia, over to you. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, we can. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Zahida. Um, so my presentation is going to be about um, the picture wall project. So the picture wall um, is a very one of the largest murals in the world, and it's located in Lahore, Pakistan, in the port of Lahore. Um, and the title of this presentation is A Museum in a Mural. So we're going to talk about how the picture wall, um, although it's a monument, can be treated as a museum, and how that has um, affected the conservation approach that we have developed and defined for this project. So the conservation, um, in fact, the digital documentation of this project was initiated in 2014 by the Al Khan Trust for Culture, um, EKTC. So the Al Khan Trust for Culture is a non-government um, organization that works to improve um, lives in the impoverished parts of the world through promotion of culture um, rather than industrialization. Um, and this project was initiated in partnership with Wall City Lahore Authority. Um, so it's an NGO and government partnership um, based project. So this wall is located in Lahore Fort, um, which is actually a very um, historic site. Um, although most of what you see in the fort today is um, from the Mughal times, particularly from Jahangir and Shah Jahan's time. Um, but there have been mentions of this fort as early as 11th century and excavations have revealed that they, it, this was a place that was occupied um, as early as the sixth century. Um, but however, what survives today is mostly a testament of the Mughal rule. Um, starting with Akbar, the construction began um, with mud bricks during Akbar's time, and it was continued by all the successors um, following Akbar, um, Jahangir, um, his son Shah Jahan, and also some contributions, but minor ones made by Aurangzeb. So this image just shows different quadrangles in the fort, which have been um, constructed by the different emperors of the Mughal Empire. The picture wall um, is located on the exterior of the fort. It's a very large mural. It's around 15, uh, 15 40 feet long and 50 feet tall on average. Um, and the scale of this mural is what's really fascinating is because, you know, it rather than having a functional purpose, it's mostly uh, meant for display and we'll be getting into that more. Um, but the reason, uh, you know, a unique mural this, like this can be treated as a museum is because it's uh, more than a monument, it's an exhibit of pictures on a wall. Um, there's, uh, there's a variety of the main types of artwork that was used in the Mughal era. Um, the scale of this wall makes it a magnificent display. And the kind of artwork that's been done is very unique. So you have figurative panels conveying a narrative of the Mughal Empire. So you literally have a lot of photographs sort of, sort of um, you know, uh, crafted out in tile work, hand cut tiles, um, to display the sort of life or, you know, scenes that you would see um, during the Mughal times. And uh, most importantly, you know, it's very clear by the style and the scale of this wall that the purpose of this wall was not functional, but purely for an observational experience, which is why um, when defining many of our procedures and approaches, we have looked at it as a museum. Um, this wall was a marvel of Jahangir and Shah Jahan particularly. The construction of this wall was started by Jahangir, uh, who was ruling from 1605 to 1627. And this was the northern, part, northern facade of the wall, which was facing the river at the time, River Ravi, which has now changed its course away from the northern facade of the wall. Um, and it was continued by his son, Shah Jahan who was ruling from 1627 to 1658. So the part that was constructed by Shah Jahan, you see on the Western facade of the wall, which is where the main entrance of the fort is today. So the wall has a variety of very important heritage craft that you will see repeatedly on many Mughal monuments um, inside Pakistan and India. Um, mostly the work in the panels is tile mosaic panels, which are glazed, fired glazed tiles. Um, this technique has been adapted from the traditional Persian technique that was used um, in Iran 
and still is. And there are a lot of fresco panels, which are wall paintings, uh, which are not just specific to the Mughal Empire, but also to Sikh Empire, and also are seen a lot in Europe. You have uh, marble work, where you have cut and dressed uh, marble jalis. You have terracotta screens, and you have cut and dressed brickwork, um, often in which glaze styles are placed. So this is really a spectacle of, you know, a variety of different craft work. Um, a craft work that's very unique, local to the subcontinent, and uh, especially very relevant to the Mughal Empire because the craft work that you see here is craft work that was very much popularized during the, was not, was not initiated by, but very much popularized by the Mughals and perfected, um, you know, in many ways by during the Mughal rule, especially the tile work. Um, so just to give you an idea, there are about, um, you know, a total of 1,200 around fresco panels. You have around 1,900 tile mosaic panels. You have pigeon houses made especially for pigeons to um, rest in. You have filigree bands running on the top and um, bottom center of the wall. Um, and although the number of the tile panels is um, not too much more than the fresco panels, um, the area that the tile panels are covering is um, almost 70% of the total surface area. And this is important because the images and the figures, the pictures that we're talking about um, are found in the tile panels. Um, and that's very interesting because, you know, it's very easy to paint pictures, you know, draw figures, capture their expressions with a brush, but it's much, much harder and challenging uh, to do it with glaze style pieces that are hand cut, you know? So this is a very sophisticated form of this craft um, that it had reached a very sophisticated form at this point. And this is why this wall has so much importance. Um, the fort is listed as a UNESCO World Heritage Site and this wall is mainly responsible for that status. Uh, so this wall has different types of figurative imagery. There's a lot of depiction of animals that you will see, um, mostly horses, lots of elephants uh, made in a very Indian style. You have um, lots of camels, um, goats, lions, you know, in um, their hunting scenes, their um, uh, crowds of animals traveling with people, um, their uh, hunting scenes, their animal fights, sort of scenes that you would see in the Mughal court and in general in life in the Mughal empire. You also have mythological creatures, which is the most interesting part. And here is again, where you see a lot of influence from the, a lot of Persian influence apart from the construction technique for the tiles that have been used. These mythological creatures are, um, heavily influenced by Persian mythology, you have demons, you all have winged creatures, angels that have captured demons, um, you have dragons uh, that are being um, attacked by the Simurg bird, which is a very important uh, bird in Persian mythology and is meant to represent the divine. Um, so while we work on these panels, we study on the inherent meaning of these panels and what they're trying to convey. You also have portraits of figures, uh, mostly on Jahangir's side, because Jahangir is known to have a personal fascination with portraits as well. Um, on the left, you have a man who is a, called a Saki, um, which means he's a wine cup bearer. Uh, you also have a decorative fan bearer. Um, this is sort of a decorative fan that is still used today in the subcontinent and some other cultures, uh, meant to dust and purify objects of spiritual, religious importance, or small spaces of importance. Um, you have a conch bearer who seems like he's about to blow on the conch. And on the extreme right, you have a candle light bearer, um, probably from the court as well. And within these portraits and um, other depictions as well, you also have representation of diverse cultural elements. So not only do you see Persian influence, you see, you know, you see Chinese influence. There's also some European influence. So you know, the images in this wall is really a holistic uh, representation of the nature of the Mughal Empire and the different uh, dynamics that were at work in the court. On in these portraits, for example, on the left, um, this seems to be. Um, you know, taking help from the way uh, Portuguese travels are depicted in miniature paintings, the hat and the robe of the man make him seem like he's a Portuguese traveler. In the center, you have probably a man from the Ottoman um, Empire, again, judging from his hat and depictions in miniature empire, um, sorry, miniature paintings. And on the right, you have a man wearing somewhat um, an English sort of a hat, um, but clearly elements that are from different cultures. 
um, you know, travelers are depicted, different skin colors are even depicted. So you have lots of, a lot of uh, variety of things going on. Um, you also have different scenes, spectacles going on, groups of people. On the left um, is a very common scene that you would still see in the subcontinent is a monkey dressed in human clothes with a goat doing some acrobats. And this is sort of a spectacle or a little circus that you still see on the streets. Um, they used to happen on the court just for the purpose of entertainment. On the top right, you have royal calligraphers from the court. So calligraphy was and still is a very important art form. Um, in the Islamic art. Um, and you have depiction of calligraphers on the picture wall. You have um, on the bottom left, um, sword fighters probably fencing. And you also have depictions of people traveling with their animals and in caravans. And last but not the least, Florian geometric patterns are also seen, but not given as much importance as the pictorial pictures. So normally in Mughal architecture, you see on architectural surfaces, lots of floral and geometric patterns. Um, but again, the focus on this wall is on the figurative imagery. And it seems that wherever you see the floral and geometric patterns, they seem like they're playing the role of fillers um, rather than taking stealing the main show, which belongs to the figurative images. So, you know, looking at these factors and treating this as a museum, this has divine our conservation approach. So here's an image of the before and after facade of the Western facade that was completed in 2017, um, 2018, sorry. Um, above is a before image and below you have after, uh, an image of the after. So you see that the way we defined the conservation approach was number one, that we decided to have a minimal intervention. So before um, actually I get into this, I want to mention that in Pakistan, um, conservation has mainly been, mostly been focused on reconstruction rather than preservation. And the main reason for that is a lack of um, conservators, a lack of um, conservation in the academic um, curriculums of universities and schools. Um, and you know, uh, in contrast, we have a number of craftsmen who have um, uh, inherited this craft. It's a these are hereditary crafts, and you know they've inherited it. Their families have been practicing them for generations, and so um, having a supply of craftsmen and a lack of conservators has led to conservation mostly being focused on reconstruction, in which you just replace what is deteriorated. But here we focused on minimal intervention with an emphasis on preservation, uh, mainly because we want to treat this wall as an opportunity to exhibit and display the different craft work, the manufacturing techniques that were used, um, and the originality and authenticity of this wall and the craft work has been um, central in this process. Um, there's been an emphasis naturally on material science, which is also a unique um, and uh, trend setting sort of approach in Pakistan, where science is not relied on heavily in conservation projects. Now, the whole purpose of involving material science is again to focus on preservation, because where there's, when you want to do preservation and when you uh, want to freeze the existing condition, you must understand the material, you must study the deterioration patterns, and that's where the role of science comes in. Um, we also did do reconstruction because, you know, promotion of the heritage craft is one of the main purposes of the project as well. But we focused on reconstruction mainly on the floral and geometric patterns um, and only where we have evidence. And preference has been given to uh, reintegration rather than reconstruction, which is a technique where you are um, supposed to give an impression and enhance the original um, panel uh, rather than completing it or replacing it with a new construction. So when we begin the work, uh, we do digital documentation and uh, a digitization of the condition assessment where we document all the different conditions of the wall. Uh, sorry, um, Zinia, uh, we have just two minutes left. Okay, I'll, I'll just be wrapping up. Um, so this is the uh, way we digitize the condition assessment and the as found condition. The conservation procedures are heavily focused on preservation where we stabilize and preserve um, in detail, um, all the panels and all the different surfaces. We have um, involvement of different international expert, experts who have trained our conservators, who are from different backgrounds. We have fine artists, we have ceramists, um, we have scientists, architects, and engineers. And a lot of material testing and analysis has gone into defining these treatments. Um, so go, uh, lastly, explaining the whole concept of reintegration, right? So this is something that has not been done on mostly on um, art, uh, monuments that you find the style work on. 
Um, you know, the style work is on a lot of masks of the Mughal period in many buildings, but these figurative images have been, um, they've been dealt with very um, carefully and reintegration and contrast to reconstruction is a technique where color is added to selective areas on the panel with the purpose of enhancing the imagery um, and making it more readable without fully completing it. So here's an image of a before and after image where we select panels that we think have figurative importance. So, you know, a dragon with a Simurgh bird is a rather important panel that we chose to enhance. Um, here again, the ability for viewers to be able to read the images and stories they convey is considered a central principle to the presentation of the panels, right? So their readability from a distance is very important because that's what the purpose of the wall is. And reintegration is not only a non-destructive way to add color to the panels on the existing surface, but also a humble approach through which the additions are meant to highlight the original work without overshadowing it as new construction would, you know, sort of steal the show and take over the original construction that has now become a little dull and aged with time since this wall is 400 years old. Similarly, we reintegrate the fresco where we just mend the islands, existing islands, instead of fully completing them. And you know, this has been a pioneering approach um, for because we've identified a museological context for this wall. And as I mentioned before, this wall can be treated as a museum because it has a variety of craftwork and its scale and the kind of narrative that it's displaying. So approaching this wall as a museum rather than just a monument and its status of being a UNESCO World Heritage Site has made a unique conservation approach possible in a country like Pakistan. The future for this wall, um, half of this wall has already been conserved and we're still conserving the rest remaining part of the wall. Um, the signage of the picture wall is in process. We will have um, signboards next to the facade and in addition to informational text about the relevant facade, QR codes will direct the viewers to in-depth data. Um, and digitizing this wall is the way forward because the picture wall will eventually be digitized with images of each panel explaining the narrative they present and showcasing the conservation work done. Um, this will be accompanied with the description and interpretation of the panels, allowing the distant viewer to have an educational experience, uh, which is what this wall can really be used as since it has different sorts of scenes, um, activities from the Mughal life. And you know, just viewing this wall in detail um, can be a very educational experience about and you learning about all the different craft work on this wall and the kind of narrative that the Mughal emperors themselves were wanting to give to travelers passing by, um, perhaps on the river, and people, um, you know, for passerbys rather than for. So, um, so yeah, that's the. It's a long, a long-term plan for the digitization, and the work is still ongoing and will be for the next two, three years. Um, so that's about it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Zinia. It's uh, really interesting, and the idea I like most is the concept of open air museum which is not very much common in pakistan even uh, not common uh, we did, did not in, in, uh, initiate any site or any wall in this way as an open air museum so i hope so uh, we will uh, understand the value of a, an open air museum and maybe able to initiate in future thank you so much again thank you uh, now uh, and now I would like to invite Mr. Najmul Saqib, uh, who is the Director of Conservation and Planning at the Wall City of Lahore Authority. Uh, he's a bulk of uh, technical uh, knowledge, and I'm highly impressed whenever I spoke to him. So, sir, please take the floor. Thank you very much, uh, Raza, Allah, for inviting us and uh, giving us a chance. I, I understand there's a time constraint as well, but however, I'll try to squeeze everything really quickly and to give you a good idea about uh, what exactly that we are doing and uh, how the things have been processed at the Wall City of the Authority. And uh, one thing which I uh, would like to emphasize here that uh, basically the, when we talk about the museums, I believe that everybody has a good understanding about one thing. One is that uh, it's, uh, it's a living museum. Another one is the uh, standing museum, the museum that's been created by us while we are going for our archaeological digs or something, the artifacts that we found it out, we display it in such a manner where we create a timeline where the timeline basically stands and explains the, all the things and that's the one of the museum. The other kind of museum that we believe in is the living museums which we deal in with the buildings and that gives a timeline as well, which, which just Zaina has explained about the Lahore Fort, which has the whole era starting from like 
1200s onward up till right up to the end of uh, even now i mean the things are going on so when when the british time era finished at the end of 1800 1900s so every time period there is some interventions and within the whole uh, area of law fort it's basically a standing uh, museum there and what we are trying to do is to preserve it conserve it for the coming generations and nations to understand how the things has been done and how the things are been preserved so i'll start with my uh, quick presentation with that one and uh, we'll start with uh, uh, can we see our screen please okay so Is the screen been shared at the moment? Yes, 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 it is. Okay, yeah. The importance. Uh, Bay, I'll start with one of the factor that what is the uh, documentation? What does it mean? And how actually we start with our things before before we go for any kind of uh, preservation. Uh, we we basically go for the proper documentation and recording of the things that really help us to understand the links of the buildings and the cultural heritage as well. It also helps us for documentation and it promotes the involvement of the public as well because our young architects and everybody tends to understand more and everybody can basically express the things in a better manner as well. And lastly, it helps us to go for the proper management plans and the conservation plans for any kind of buildings. Uh, and of course, uh, I don't want to go into too much theoretical things because I, I believe I, I'll take you fairly quickly into what exactly and how things are, uh, as everybody is aware of that documentation techniques earlier was only but two ways. It was with the help of uh, measurement drawings, by making small uh, with the measuring tapes and then taking some photographs and documenting it and measuring. And that traditional method was never been accurate. And of course there was uh, an error which, which was always there, which has taken up and now what we are doing at this stage. And of course, that system, which was a bit slower as well, was never been accurate. Now, what we, the system that we are using is a 3D uh, laser scanning machine and a photogrammetry as well. So that really enables us to basically record everything. And uh, that uh, recorded data is always been there and in, in the archival libraries as well for the students to research on all these buildings. And uh, since we got all this uh, high-tech machines, is a uh, Parallels machine, which we, which helps us to produce all three 3D uh, documents, drawings, and walkthroughs as well. Next, uh, our three laser scanning systems. I will take you uh, with one of the system that uh, I'll uh, show you. One of the uh, another, our this is the uh, 16th, 17th century. The, uh, you can see the cloud data which is for the Sadgara, which is almost like uh, an hour and a half uh, drive towards south from Lahore. And it's a walled city uh, from the Sikh era. And we have documented it too with the help of uh, this three laser scanning machine. And uh, you can see all this, uh, there's uh, all structures uh, been, uh, been laid out and uh, we have uh, documented before the things will be started. And I'll just uh, sorry, show you. Uh, sorry, sir, your presentation is uh, not visible on the screen. It's your window screen. Not coming. Uh, no, sir, I think it's minimized. Okay, can you just raise this one? Just bear with me. And... Yeah, yeah, please. Okay. Excuse me, see the lane. It's just minimized and we, it shows the window can or in, <laughs> on the screen. Okay, it's going on, sir. Just minimize this. It has to be. Minimize this one. Open it. Just open the previous one, then I'll take it from there. Minimize this one. Where is the original? Thank you. 
बिल्कुल Can you see this one yes. now? Yes. 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 Okay. Now it is visible. Uh, I think there's two programs is uh, getting a bit problematic for open up this uh, start one a bit heavy one. So I'll just explain through what the procedure that we go through. Uh, of course, once it's all been uh, carried out and then we make all these uh, drawings through this procedure, and it's it really gives a very detailed. Uh, the drawings of these ones, you can see how how details it can give. I mean, it really scans everything, every crack and every bulging of the material. It has been recorded that one, and that really helped us to come back in our studios. And then we basically analyze each and every part of the structure, and that really helps us to get into and then analyze everything, uh, like uh, the floorings, the the archival uh, data, which is basically the, the okay, keep on moving. Uh, we just analyze the original, the old, new, and everything, and it really helps us to basically document every plan properly. And uh, you can see the detail. This was the original floor, and it was been uh, sorted out. And uh, we we take it from there. And from after this one, once the analysis has been done, where we record everything, uh, you can see all these data drawings are prepared. There we got everything in our libraries now. For the students to uh, run on this one, uh, and then we basically make our conservation plan with these ones. Another project which we have done it is the Akbari Hamam, which was there in Lahore Fort as well. This was the earliest uh, building of uh, of uh, Mughal era, and from there it's uh, we take it, and you can see this was the original site where it was like, and we started clearing it from there, and once we start uh, clearing the site, we had. All this uh, structure, which was sorry, it was a bit quick there, and we cleared this one. There was all structure been built up on top of this one. We cleared those sites and we cleared everything. And underneath, what we found it, it was uh, basically uh, a hammam, which was of the Akbar era, and we cleared it. Now this is the present condition. Uh, this is how it is now. It was before and after clear indications. So this, these all efforts which we carry out with the help of. Uh, the documentation, digital documentation, this really helps us to go for the minimum uh, uh, deviation from the uh, uh, the conservation plans for any kind of uh, historical buildings. And uh, this is what we I was trying to show you earlier was the Meech Afriyazam. Uh, this is how the digital plans were. We that enables us to actually produce a whole uh, street facades as well, and it enabled us to document every possible the way we found it out. The way the things were there before the conservation was started, and you will see the results. I will show you, and uh, it's this is all wall city, which is about like 40 meter by 40 meter, and this every street was documented before any work started on ground. These are the all facades with the gates, and uh, this is uh, before we started any work. Um, these are the elevations. And I'll show you the pictures because the things is very important that we have the data available with us uh, where actually the things, uh, the way it's been, been carried out. It really helped us to analyze. These are the before and after picture clearly indicates how it was and after preservation, uh, what is it looks like now. That's the inside condition of the courtyard from the outside. And this is only possible once we you have the digital uh, documentation done for any kind of site, because if you have that one, that really enables you to draw the accuracy of the work that has to be carried out at the site. We can easily identify the deterioration in the area and what kind of work has to be carried out as well. So that is all about, um, because I strongly believe in that uh, the, the documentation is the basic thing where in the conservation, if it's not been done properly, it's not been recorded properly, you end up, you can end up in coming up uh, irreversible and damages, which I believe is not uh, something which anybody should be going for. So thank you very much for this one.
Thank you so much, sir. And uh, it's really nice to have another idea of a museum beyond the artifacts. And I really wish that um, we can initiate this concept in long run in Pakistan. So thank you so much, uh, uh, Najam Saab. Uh, up next, we have uh, uh, Dr. Anna. Mike, uh, I'm so sorry, <laughs> I'm very big in pronunciation. Uh, she has been working in the field of museums uh, and digital technology since uh, 2010. She is also teaching an online course uh, regarding social media marketing for museum professionals and uh, a founder of uh, Ideas for Museums. She runs an informal gathering for museum professionals, such as uh, Drinking About Museum and the Museum Club as well as several groups on Facebook. So Dr. Anna, welcome to the show. Over to you, please. Uh, hello, dear colleagues. Many thanks for in inviting me to join the conference today. I'm going to talk about uh, social media projects uh, run by Russian museums during the pandemic. And I would like to start with a brief introduction about the history of uh, how museums work with social media so that you uh, uh, can understand the context in which we work now. So uh, Russian museums started uh, using social media more than 10 years ago, around 2009, 2010. And the very first steps were made by individuals and enthusiasts who believe that social media is a very prospective and important way of communicating with our audiences. Then uh, in 2014, 2015, museums started collaborating with each other and uh, ran joint projects on social media. The Ministry of Culture got involved in 2015, 2016 uh, by first of all, uh, providing some general uh, strategy strategy of how museums should use uh, social media uh, by providing uh, some courses and educational materials and of course uh, uh, waiting for some metrics from museums on how they success on social media. Uh, several of the other facts. Um, museums in Russia started using social media for live streams in 2017 and by 2018 social media management uh, has become an everyday routine so we uh, approach the pandemic quite prepared uh, because in 20 19, 2020, social media has become a digital dimension of uh, museums. And now I'd like to uh, share several lessons uh, which we learned during the pandemic. The first one is importance of teamwork. I think that uh, for the first time in the museum's uh, history, almost every member of staff was somehow involved in content production and distribution. And this helped museums to develop truly interactive projects, not just live streams of shows or excursions, stores, etc., but projects that uh, were designed uh, to be interactive and involving uh, visitors and viewers to join. Uh, social media also what? became uh, a space to build communities, and this is also very important because uh, we were closed for many months and it was uh, necessary to somehow uh, keep being in touch with our audiences. So not just distribute content, but also build communities around this content and museums. And of course, it was very important to show the human side of the museums to the public. So move beyond the official way of sharing information and share stories about people who work in museums. So now I'm going to share some of the projects uh, and methods which were used uh, I guess that these methods can be applicable in uh, other museums as well. So the first campaign is the We Miss You campaign. It was launched by one of the theaters, not museums. And the idea was to share photos taken uh, in museums and other cultural institutions with the posters saying what actually museums or cultural institutions missed. So on the first uh, picture, you can see a woman holding a poster saying that nobody comes to a library. The next one is that nobody uh, trying to eat these cookies. Uh, so uh, dozens of these pictures were distributed uh, on the social media. And this project, uh, this campaign, had a very good media coverage because media also struggled for some content uh, and they uh, shared these pictures 
uh, on their resources. So the next uh, type of project is online exhibitions. Uh, here you can see an example, a screenshot of uh, Tumen, um, of, yeah, uh, Tumen University uh, Museum, uh, which uh, used Instagram to run a virtual exhibition. Uh, you can see that uh, they used background uh, image with a map and put on this map objects which were a part of this exhibition. So it became not just a series of posts, but a series of posts uh, united by, uh, um, by one covering image. So, uh, of course, there were other types of exhibitions with using uh, landing pages, like, for example, Tilda, but also like this one on Instagram. Uh, the next type of project is interactive live streams. Uh, these live streams, for example, the one uh, on the uh, screen right now, uh, which was run by uh, the Museum of uh, Pyotr Tchaikovsky, a famous Russian composer. Uh, so they pre-recorded these videos and included interactive elements in these videos. So, for example, quiz questions, uh, questions for discussions, and they live streamed these videos during uh, Night of Museums. And uh, members of staff uh, were communicating with the audiences via text comments uh, below these videos. And you can see I highlighted that there were more than 136 comments, which is quite uh, quite large number for a 20 minutes or 30 minutes uh, live stream. Uh, the next one is sharing pictures of uh, the territory, of parks, of the spaces, of the collections, as wallpapers and screensavers. For example, the Moscow Museum, um, Museum Reserve Tsaritsina, which has a large uh, park and beautiful palace, uh, they shared pictures from Spring Park. Uh, it was the first quarantine when everything in Moscow was closed and people who missed this park could download it. Uh, these pictures and use them uh, as wallpapers for their smartphones, tablets, and laptops. I need to stress the importance of content creation and distribution. So, for example, the Museum of Moscow hosted a number of online discussions about the problems and issues uh, which citizens of Moscow faced during the pandemic. And they ran these online discussions via Zoom. Then they took notes from these discussions and shared these notes with popular online magazines. So the discussion led to text content and was distributed with the help of media. Also, this museum partnered uh, with Book Publishing House and they launched a birthday party project for kids so uh, families can uh, approach museum and have, have a call on Zoom where members of staff uh, congratulated uh, a kid and gave a book from this publishing house. It was a short one event, like 15, maybe 20 minutes, and it was free to participate. Of course, a number of spaces were limited, but anyway, it was a very interesting and promising initiative. Uh, next uh, thing is that, of course, people like learning about other people and YouTube uh, likes when we distribute content in a proper way. And I mean uh, that uh, YouTube uh, promotes those videos which uh, have good uh, thorough description, timestamps and uh, call to action. So this is a screenshot from uh, Facebook. Uh, it's a post of Perm's uh, Museum of Contemporary Art. Uh, it was an interview with one of the members of staff and you can see here, oh, sorry, the text is in Russian, but I will explain it. Uh, that there is timestamps. Uh, the video is quite short, maybe seven, eight, uh, five, six minutes. So in which part what is describing and then call to action, sign yeah. up for our channel. Uh, on yeah. YouTube. And um, another example, it's not from, uh, from a museum, but uh, this method can be uh, used by anyone. Uh, this is a project, uh, Moscow for the Eyes of Engineer. Uh, it's a tour company. Uh, while during the quarantine, of course, they couldn't provide uh, 
live uh, offline tours. So they used maps, digitized maps, uh, maps uh, Google, Yandex, Yandex, it's a Russian uh, internet company, and they provided tour by using these uh, digitized maps and panoramas on these maps. I know that uh, some museums uh, who uh, had virtual tours on their websites also use these virtual tours to run virtual uh, events. So they share screen with these uh, panoramas and uh, show around them. And of course, it's very important to be informal sometimes and share some uh, humor-like content. Uh, the already mentioned the Museum Tsaritsina uh, regularly shared some videos and photos of animals uh, who live uh, in park, for example, this nice squirrel. And the final example is not from Russia, but it's very uh, inspiring. Uh, the National Kobo Museum uh, in the United States um, gave their head of security uh, opportunity to run all social media ch channels during the pandemic. Uh, and Tim, Tim the cowboy, uh, did that very well. Uh, it was sometimes naive, sometimes um, ironic. And finally, uh, the museum launched an uh, offline exhibition about this initiative. So there are two screenshots here. And uh, this example shows how trust uh, between members of staff uh, is important that if you um, can trust your members, maybe not the members of staff, maybe not just those who do PR or marketing, but those from other departments, it can make our social uh, media more diverse and bring more voices uh, uh, on the internet, which is very important when we promote museums and heritage. So many thanks for your attention. I am open up for questions. I can answer them now or in comments on Zoom. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Anna, for your wonderful presentations. And um, it, this is how a museum in digital age should be looked like. Even this uh, social media and museum uh, collaboration has uh, give a kind of a new train to, to connect museums and audience. And the second important thing, which I really would like to add here, that uh, the way you are, uh, you know, we are talking a lot about uh, women in museums. But today in the conference, since the beginning, I have seen a uh, moms who are handling the museum and their uh, young kids, which is uh, for them, uh, I, I respect a lot and my high regards to you and Daisa Khan as well. So uh, without any further delay, uh, we, have, uh, we would like to call uh, the last speaker of ICOM Pakistan session, Mr. Uh, Gobani. I, am, I hope I pronounced his name correctly. Uh, he's one, our friend from Museum, from Museum of um, Botswana, uh, South Africa. Uh, and uh, he's a curator under the Ethnological Division of uh, National Museum over there. He will speak on museum collection, digitalization, and uh, democratization. So, Mr. Gobani, please. Okay. Thank you very much. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. I practice really a lot. <laughs> That's good. Um, okay. Is the presentation visible? Um, are you able to share to see my screen that said? Uh, no, I'm so sorry. Do you have a share screen option at your site? Yeah, okay. uh, unfortunately, we cannot see your presentation. Yes, now it is visible. Okay. Okay. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, protocol observed. My name is Hwaba Nemunsu. I'm an ethnology curator here at Botswana National Museum. First and foremost, I would like to thank Alcom Pakistan for giving me this opportunity to be part of this conference, more especially during these 
and precarious times of the global COVID-19 pandemic. Ladies and gentlemen, it is very clear that we are living in a historic time period, which reinforces digitalization as a strategy, as the pillar that can ensure the sustainability, survival, and relevance of the museum institution going forward. Based on these sentiments, the title of my presentation today is Museum Digitalization and Democratization of Collections. I would like to kickstart the presentation by taking a look at key terms, museum digitalization and democratization of collections. From the outset, let me state that digitalization is one of the key reforms, it's one of the main reforms in the delivery of public services and public goods. Museums as public institutions are or ought to go this digital digitalization transformation. We had reforms in the past. We had the structural adjustment programs. And towards the 1980s, we had the new public service management reforms. All of these reforms have an impact on the survival and the relevance of the museum institution. They are conceived as strategies to improve the efficiency, efficacy, and effectiveness of public institutions inclusive of museums. Let Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that in, in, in my view, I believe that the museum institution can improve its efficiency, its effectiveness through democratization of its collections, through a drive, a push for social development, as well as digitalization. We know that the museum has a history um, of is in its origin, the museum was not open to the entire, to the general public. It was a place for the elite, a place for the few. However, the 21st century museum has a different agenda, an agenda of social development, an agenda of social inclusion, a drive for social equality. So, this can be achieved through the advent of digitalization, particularly as we are living in the digital age. I would like us to talk uh, to the point on the digital museum and equal access to collections and other museum services. Questions may arise as to how will the museum be able to bridge gaps, social gaps of social inequalities in our societies. In my view, through the advent of digitalization, the museum is in a position to create cultural experiences, cultural experience for diverse, for diverse constituents, for its diverse constituents. In turn, the museum will portray itself as a visitor-centered museum. Subsequently, as a visitor-centered museum, the museum will be able to deal with, to address specific issues, social problems that have to, deal, to do with its specific constituents. For example, with the advent of social media, with the advent of social media, the millennial, the young people are able to interact with museum collections through visual exhibitions. 
This will then lead to widening of the museum audiences. And it comes with the responsibility of being transparent when handling collections. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to talk to the point on, I would like to talk to the point on the digital museum and the transparency on collections usage. My colleagues and audiences, Trans museum transparency is one of the key factors, is one of the key factors in democratization of collections. Through the advent of digitalization, diverse museum audiences, museum constituents and publics have access to inf information about museum digital collections and museum virtual exhibitions. This serves to facilitate, to facilitate museum constituents to be um, co-curators, to, to participate in content generation and knowledge generation regarding museum collections. This leads to the formation or the establishment of a participatory museum. Then last but not least, I would like to talk to the point on the digital museum and civic participation or a civic engagement. Ladies and gentlemen, the ICOM slogan is very clear. Museums have no borders, but a network. Through the advent of digitalization, museums are able to transcend boundaries of space, time, and distance. This enables them, this enables museums to be able to facilitate cultural exchange among diverse groups. The online presence of museums improves cultural participation of different museum constituents. And this participation is necessary for cultural empowerment and is a practical support for practices of cultural diversity. Ladies and gentlemen, let me conclude by reiterating the fact that during this digital age, the, the relevance of the museum institution is by and large dependent on its capabilities to digitalize and democratize its collections. Through the advent of digitalization, the museum can contribute meaningfully to social development of its audiences. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much uh, for your presentation. And we are already running a bit late uh, than the due time. So without any further delay, I would like to pass the control to uh, my fellow colleague, Mr. Santiago for an exciting session by ICOM ICMH. I'm so sorry uh, for the delay that occurred. So over to Mr. Santiago. Thank you very much. Uh, and we have seen the excellent presentation we, we've had the pleasure of hearing. The digital world has been uh, related to the museum work already for a while. And we have seen digitalization is um, mixed with the preservation efforts with the ways we as museum workers reach the public and in the either way as we as museums want to be relevant for our societies. Even though the digital has been there for all, already for a couple of decades and it's in the, there's been efforts to bring the digital to the museums. And now in the pandemic, and we have, it's been an opportunity, a forced opportunity to turn to the digital. 
It's been really interesting also because before we always talk about the possibilities of the digital. And we thought that the digital would bring everything and anything. Now, already almost a year and a half has passed from of the pandemic. We've seen that there's a lot of possibilities for the digital, but there's also limits for the digital. As my mother said at the beginning, the digital is a space and it's an, an important space, but we have to remember that it's not going to uh, replace uh, the, the, the physical aspects of the machines. First, because not we have to remember that sometimes not everybody has access to the digital world and not everybody is as uh, expert in dealing with the digital uh, facilities as we, as, as we desire. Nonetheless, the, this uh, uh, mixing of the museum activities with the digital domain is not going to end. Even if the pandemic stops, we hope it's going to stop soon, uh, we as museum workers have to know that this dimension of our work is not going to end. The world is not going to be as it was before. So that's why it's so important to discuss this kind of issues. And that's why I'm so important to be part uh, of so, this. Sorry, uh, uh, Mr. Robledo, uh, your presentation cannot be seen now. Uh, yes, I, I, was, I, I was introducing the, 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 the next presentation. So we're going to start with uh, Michel Rouget. He's an archaeologist and he's the general director of the Museum Park of Alessia in France. And he's going to talk about Alessia, examples of digital devices to reach a new audience. Hi, uh, thank you, Mr. Okay, I think we need to stop here the presentation, the previous one. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Yes, okay. Uh, is it possible to share my screen, please? I can't share because there is the last presentation on the screen. Mr. Gopal, please stop sharing the presentation so the next presenter can share the screen. I can share for the moment. So I, I will start even if I can share my screen. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you, ICOM Pakistan and uh, ICMA for the invitation to this conference. Um, and I, I will go to speak about uh, the new, um, how we use digital devices um, and the digital uh, museography in uh, the new scenography of the Museum of Alesia, which is an archaeological site in France, as Santiago said. Um, I can, I maybe, I will try to share my screen. I hope it will be okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, Mr. Monso, please uh, close your uh, presentation. Yes, I think this is the problem. Yes. Mr. Monso? Is it right? Close your presentation. Can you see my uh, presentation? Yeah. Uh, From Avesia? With the, with the building, with the big, very beautiful purple light. Is it all right for you? No, we it cannot is, see. No? You can't see. Right. No. We see previous presentation. All right. It should be closed. I can't share my screen. You're right. Okay. At the moment. We are trying to close. All right. Thank you. Nothing. This is live with Zoom, so it's yeah, normal. <laughs> in your computer, you can close if it is closed. Uh, for the moment, I can't can share can for the close? moment. Yeah. Can I close? Okay. Yeah. 
Your presentation will be closed in your computers. Close to the computer. Yes, yes, yes. Close and then it will. At the moment, I can't, but I will continue uh, to give you, but it will be very easier with uh, pictures for you to understand what I want to explain and to show you. Uh, I will try again, maybe, I don't know. These are the challenges of- Can you, can you, can you see the, my document or not, not, not? And share. Gabane Monso, is it possible to to stop the sharing of your screen? Because I've got a message that said that maybe. Uh, what we oh yeah, have now it's working. I will try again. Is it right? Can you see? Uh, yes, yes Alicia. Oh, yes, very good. Perfect. Thank you very much for everybody, and sorry for uh, this uh, inconvenience uh, with the Zoom, but it's uh, normal. Uh, so, um, Alicia is um, um, is in France. Uh, it's an, an archaeological site. Uh, where it's famous because in uh, 52 before Christ, um, there is the siege and the battle of Alesia. Uh, this is a part of the Gallic War, uh, of the conquest of Caesar um, in, uh, in Gallic uh, territory. Uh, and Alesia is famous because this is the, the battle um, with the face to face uh, between Bersangetorix and the uh, um, Gallic tribes and uh, versus Caesar. Uh, and uh, the Roman army. And of course, um, it's a uh, Gallic defeat. And this is the, um, the start of the Gallo-Roman period in uh, the territory who will become uh, later uh, France. Uh, and um, this archaeological site was um, recognized in the 19th century with uh, Napoleon III, uh, who was very interested by um, the archaeology of uh, um, the Gallic uh, conquest, or the Roman conquest in, in all. And uh, archaeology uh, helped uh, very well to understand the, the siege of uh, Alesia with, in the middle, in the occidental, the Gallic tribe and the Sangetorix, and all around the Roman fortifications and the, the camps, the Roman camps, um, it's a, a very big uh, battle in the antiquity. Um, since the 19th century, Vesanjuric is a very famous uh, character in the French history. Uh, and uh, as you can see with the moustache uh, and the long hair, it's a very cliche of the representation of Gallic civilization. Um, and uh, this is what we are going to speak uh, in, the, in the museum. Uh, in, in 2012, uh, a new building, a new museum, this is the, the place of Museo Park Alesia, with the architect uh, Bernard Chumi, uh, who created this um, um, new building, very contemporary architecture in the country of uh, Burgundy in France. And you can see the Museum of Alesia here and the uh, reconstitution of Roman fortifications outside. And there is a second place of Alesia. Uh, this is the remain of the Gallo-Roman town, um, which will be developed in the beginning of uh, the, the second century, century after Christ. Um, and uh, the, main, um, the main object of um, my participation today is to uh, show you uh, the new permanent exhibition uh, which is very recent because uh, it opened just at the beginning of this month. Uh,
I think we lost Michelle. Oh, Michelle has disappeared. So I think in the no, meantime, no, he's no more on the line. So we should follow with the program, and if he returns, he may be able to finish his presentation, or what we should do. So yeah, let's let's do this. So there, our next presentation is by Selchuk Artut. He's a visual artist, also a PhD, and he now works as an associate professor of visual arts and visual, visual communication design in the visual communication design program of the Savanchi University in Turkey. And he's going to talk with us about the technological art preservation in museums, digitalization of media artworks. Hello, are you able to hear me and see me? Hello, hello, hello. Hearing you, but we're not seeing you. you. We're, we're not seeing, not seeing me. Um, hearing you, but not seeing. All right, I'll... Coming. No. Not coming? No, not yet. Ah, yes, you. Was there? You all here. right, okay. Yes, this is yeah. all right. <laughs> now you have me. Hello, everyone, for all those of people from all different continents of the earth. Um, I'll share my screen. First of all, thank you for inviting me. Um, so I will talk about the technological art preservation uh, of museums and digitalization of media artworks. Um, as with all components that contain um, technology in today's art, there are various concerns and questions, uh, question marks in, in terms of carrying um, technological work of art to the future. Um, with the brief introduction, it doesn't emphasize, but I'm an exhibiting artist, so and I have some of my works uh, under collections. Uh, of museums and private collections. So that made me wonder how the, these works will survive when I'm not around um, certain, for certain reasons. If there is another exhibition in which my works are included, they can call me in and I can help them to install things, but things will be much difficult when you are trying to uh, do restoration or conservation on, on technology uh, using uh, um, artworks, um, but comparing it with the traditional artworks, um, it's it's basically the similar attitude. Like I mean, if it's a painting, the, the work done is to to enhance the quality of the dye, the painting, and the and the the physical uh, uh, appearance. Um, although it is on a, on, a, on a basis, it's the same thing with the technological uh, artworks. Uh, the, uh, the main problem is that the technology is changing. And even though you can replace a color with a, a similar uh, color, you won't be able to change um, an operating system with a new operating system because the, the application will have trouble in, in um, justifying the needs uh, for such a specific use. So for ECOM has a uh, beautiful uh, definition for conservation. It is all measures and actions aimed at safeguarding um, tangible uh, cultural heritage while ensuring its accessibility to present and future generations. Um, as you can see, it, it says tangible. So I think this definition needs a revisit because it's getting harder and harder to find uh, new works of culture which are only tangible. Uh, you, you get a lot of like digital works of art, 
and you can't even touch them. But conservation has to also embrace such uh, uh, facts as well. So conservation embraces preventive conservation, remedial conservation, restoration. All measures and actions should respect the significance and the physical properties of the cultural heritage system, heritage item. According to this definition, conservation includes preventive protection, curator protection and restoration. And all measures and actions to be taken in this direction should be done in a way that respects the importance and physical characters of the cultural heritage item. So this is a bit of, a, as I said, a traditional approach towards this, um, this study. So according to Marches, uh, in, his, um, in his paper in 2013, he mentions any conservation strategy for digital artworks should deal with the issues associated with the continuous maintenance, uh, the short-lived qualities of such works, the discontinuity of technological components on which they are based, the inevitability of evolving sizes and diversities in a museum collection require sustained efforts uh, of conservation. But uh, how are we going to like um, conceptualize such artworks? Because all the definitions are getting more into hybrid forms. And uh, even though we call some of the works like digital art, um, this also has this confusion of whether an artwork has been digitalized. Uh, for that purpose, we have a born digital terminology. And also uh, some people would like to refer it to media art, electronic arts, internet art. Um, I myself as a scholar and a, an artist who are, who's doing works in this field um, try to um, um, emphasize and mention the words of use, uh, technological art. Since we are uh, influenced, heavily influenced in this age with the use of technology, our lives have been um, enormously changed. The, um, all the artists, all the museums, all the, the people who are working in the cultural industry are heavily affected by the use of technology. So I think the technology, technological art represents a better umbrella term uh, that embraces most of the artworks. For instance, like in this artwork for Janda Shishman, who is a, a, an artist based in, in Turkey, he made a, a light uh, system, reflection system, uh, not only running a video file, uh, but also has a, a specific uh, a representation style. So when you're trying to digitalize this, the only thing you can digitalize about this could be a photograph of it. But the whole experience is, a, since it's a performative form, it requires you to be um, standing there and, and, and feeling the, the artwork. It's very difficult to, to digitize this, to, to, to use it for, uh, for protection purposes. But here's the, the main uh, issue about the technological artwork. Technological loss represents a grave danger to the technological art. So most of the, 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 uh, the items uh, are uh, going out of date. So here's a video that I would like to present, but I think I forgot to um, let me share again because I think I would have to click yeah, share computer sound in here. Now I'll move my. The felt suit was one of an addition of 100 felt suits that were made in 1970 by the artist Joseph Boyce. It appeared as a suit, but it wasn't a suit that you could wear. It was just this felt sculpture. The Tate acquired one of these in 1981. It was in the collection, um, doing just fine. And then in 1989, it was requested for display. And when they went to look at it, it was unfortunately discovered to be infested with clothes moths. There were eggs, there were full moths, there were larvae, and there were dead moths as well. And it resulted in a lot of the areas of, of the felt actually being disintegrated and eaten away completely. So it was an absolute tragedy in terms of the artwork. And they did a lot of investigation to try and see if the artwork could be restored in some way or conserved in some way. The conclusions to the investigation were that the suit could not be restored or conserved. Yeah, um, so the whole suite by Joseph Boyce is gone missing. But um, so I, I, it's not a technological uh, object for sure, but uh, the technology has to be there to 
um, to find the, the relevant uh, protective um, uh, uses to, to keep this substance alive, but it wasn't able, they weren't able to, to have a success on that. So considering the scope of the responsibilities of the conservation um, conservators, the criteria to be put forward by the artists who produce the work are extremely important in determining the elements of how the protection uh, should be. So for such a purpose, it's been two years, me and a few of my colleagues, uh, two indeed, uh, Osman Sarat Karaman and Jamal Yilmaz from the same Sabancı University. Um, we organized a series of events where we invited so many scholars from uh, different uh, institutions, including Sakıp Sabancı Museum, um, ZPM in, in Karlsruhe or British uh, Tate Modern uh, to have a discussion forum on how we can find strategies towards protecting technological art pieces. And this is a recent publication that we did. Uh, it's an online uh, uh, book where you can have an access. So I'd like to um, drive your attention to this uh, publication in which you can find uh, 12 different uh, articles from two different scholars. I myself uh, exist as a, as a writer and also as an editor for this piece. We also had some interviews for the artists uh, where you can find uh, how they uh, appeal such uh, resources. Sorry, I've been I'm in a quite a loud environment. I'll move somewhere. Thank you so much, Dr. Arthur, uh, your, your presentation it was really interesting because it shows how the digital is not only a space for opportunities, but it's also a space for challenges. And it does something we should all be aware of. And uh, right now we have again Michel Rouget with us again. So I think we should continue with his presentation about the Alessia Museum. Yeah, thank you. I'm very sorry, uh, Santiago and everybody for I lost my uh, internet connection. So I will try to uh, share for the new time uh, my screen. Can you see my uh, presentation? Yes, we can. Yes, okay. So um, I, I want uh, to explain you uh, how we use the digital devices uh, in the our new permanent exhibition, very uh, very recent, um, on um, one thousand one hundred four meters. Um, the the introduction movie um, is. Um, it, as you can see uh, on the screen, uh, is there, there are different comedians uh, who um, speak about the wrong ideas they have in their head about the, uh, the Gallic civilization. And on the big screen behind them, uh, you can um, have some illustration with Yumo, uh, who um, uh, illustrates which illustrates uh, these wrong ideas, and the main message, of course, is to uh, to our visitors is thanks for coming in Museo Park Alesia. Now we are going to uh, give you the right uh, answers uh, all along your visits. Uh, so the the beginning of the the of the tour, the beginning of the visit is a is a just a digital um, room like this. Uh, of course, uh, all along the, the the permanent exhibition, you can have some uh, screen of um, for documentations with different in a different way ways uh, that um, there's some database uh, database that you can uh, you can find the you can search in the collection of posters of pictures of uh, of books. Of archaeological books, of archaeologic uh, um, writings uh, from uh, archaeologists of archaeologists of Alesia, uh, and you can see on the right that uh, we use 3D uh, elements uh, to explain, for example, uh, the the remains of the Gallo-Roman uh, period. So it's very. Uh, 
um, devices of uh, to to learn uh, database. Um, another thing that we imagine for this new permanent exhibition is a very large projection with an um, animated map uh, to explain the, the, the evolution of the and the beginning of the Altstadt period or Latin period uh, and the, the links between the, um, the Gallic uh, territory and the, how the Roman, the Roman Empire uh, is going very, is growing up in uh, in the Mediterranean uh, area, but maybe the more original that uh, we um, we we created uh, for this new permanent exhibition is uh, something around the the, the gaming um, with here two examples uh, on your right a uh, virtual excavations. Uh, when you can um, discover the different steps uh, for uh, excavations uh, with the back row loader, uh, the first step with the back row loader, with the fix X in the second time and the third time the drawer. Uh, and with your finger, you can uh, have the different sensation and you can find some archaeological object and you can um, uh, put it in an archaeological book. Uh, uh, to uh, understand how an archaeologist uh, can uh, can work uh, uh, during an excavation, uh, and another way um, on your on your um, uh, on the other side uh, of the pictures um, is is a is, it's like a video game uh, when you can uh, choose to be uh, or a Gallic soldier or Roman soldier, and you are going to, with the technology of Kinect, you can um, um, learn how to use the shield, how to use, how to use the, the word, um, and uh, you can have some points, it's like a training uh, to be a good soldier in the Roman army or in the, in the Gallic army because uh, the, the, the fighting, the face-to-face -face is very important uh, in Adi. Uh, other way, you can have a, a quiz uh, to find uh, what is the origin of uh, uh, word, of fooding, or, uh, um, or, or dressing. Uh, if, if it's Gallic or Roman or both, and you can uh, create it, you can take a picture of your face uh, and create your avatar, your, your character, uh, who is going to uh, be in the decor of the quiz. And uh, you can play with uh, your family, with your group, or with people that you uh, don't know uh, who are other visitors. Uh, and on the right, you have the, um, you can see the reproduction of the Scorpio, Scorpio, the, this uh, Roman weapon, uh, and just uh, on the screen uh, you can play uh, to train to shoot with the Scorpio uh, and to make uh, to mark some points. Uh, and uh, the same idea is to uh, uh, are you uh, ready to go uh, to join the the Roman army or not? Uh, maybe you need more uh, training. Um, Two other um, devices, um, as you know, uh, Caesar uh, wrote the Debelo Gallico uh, book, uh, and here this is a real book that you can turn the pages, uh, and uh, on this book you have the, um, the, the text of Caesar print in Latin, and you can hear uh, the text in Latin language, so it's very new in France. There's no uh, archaeological uh, museum where uh, you can hear Latin language. So you can hear Latin language. And on the other page, you have the translation who, which appears. And you have some uh, drawings uh, which illustrated what, uh, what is happening in, in the text. So it's a, it's a very, there's a six double page like this. And it's very, uh, it's very new in, uh, in French museum. And you have some uh, talking head. Uh, maybe uh, you know the, the this uh, device. Um, this is like a sculpture, like uh, antique bust. 
and uh, they can um, at the moment with the, the technique the technology of mapping uh, this uh, sculpture is going to uh, be alive and uh, Caesar or best Sagittarius here or Napoleon the third yes three three uh, talking heads in, in, in the visit uh, are going to speak directly to the to the visitors so it's very uh, it's like magic uh, you are in the visit you it seems to be just a sculpture it at the moment but, uh, the sculpture is going to uh, to talk to you so it's a very um, it's a very right uh, a very good effect for our visitors um, you can see the the idea of shadow puppets to um, it's just a projection on the wall in the middle of the showcase uh, with archaeological piece and uh, it's just um, uh, a way to give some light uh, all among the all around the, this um, archaeological object uh, to give some uh, elements of the daily life of the people in the antiquity and on the right you can you have an example of the animated showcase uh, in the showcase, you have right um, you have real archaeological object, and on the screen, uh, there's a, a comedian uh, who uh, who appears. Uh, she's playing an archaeologist, and she's going to explain the object that uh, they are in the um, in the showcase, and uh, with animation, um, uh, with three D animation, and you can see more details of uh, this. Uh, in the Museo Park Alesia, uh, there is more um, using of uh, digital devices. Uh, on our website, we have a virtual exhibition about the uh, fooding uh, in, uh, during the antiquity. Or uh, on the site of the remain, yellow Roman remains, we have a 3D application with uh, the elevation of uh, and the creation of the, of the buildings. Uh, from the Gallo Roman periods. And it's the first time that we can uh, imagine how uh, was the daily life in, uh, in the Gallo Roman Alesia. So, to finish, um, for us, um, I think it's very important for an, an archaeological site, an archaeological museum, to use uh, the technology and the di different digital. Uh, uh, devices, but um, as you can uh, understand, uh, there's some very various digital devices for all the family. Uh, so you can uh, uh, you can um, have the attention of kids or adults. Um, for us, it's very important to have the a funny um, uh, atmosphere, uh, funny devices, uh, but always with scientific. Content it's very important for us, uh, but it's a new way with uh, with humor to uh, to uh, reach uh, the attention of um, our visitors. Of course, um, the technology must be always useful and not as a gadget. It's not just uh, to have uh, to say yes. We have many many technology. Uh, all the technology is useful for uh, the um, to understand. The collection, the collection, for example, uh, or to understand the historical context of uh, the Gallo-Roman period of what uh, happened uh, during the siege. Um, it's of course uh, this uh, digital device is a new way to share a scientific and historical context of uh, all um, the, the subject of um, Alesia and the antiquity and. Uh, since once a month, uh, we, we can be sure that it's a, it's a very good way to reach the young generation. I, I uh, ask, uh, I talk with uh, many uh, families uh, uh, during one month, and they are very uh, excited and very uh, happy to uh, share a moment uh, of visit with adults and kids. And of course, the, the importance of the collection are uh, essential, but uh, all the digital devices are very uh, useful to help to, uh, uh, to pass a very good moment uh, to visit. Thank you for your attention and very sorry for my uh, technical problem. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Michelle. You provide us with an excellent example of what a museum might do with the digital, because there's not only content that may provide an experience to the, to the audience that cannot reach the museum during the pandemic, but it's also quite interesting content that will enhance the experience of the site. And as you said, it's, a, it's content that's scientifically, scientifically valid, but also entertaining for children and adults alike. But thank you very much much, Michelle. Now we're going to talk with Dr. Nuran Khaled. She's a lecturer in environmental architecture and urbanism program of the Faculty of Engineering of the Ain Shams University in Egypt. She's also a colleague from the IGMA uh, board member, and she's going to talk about developing museum visitors experience through digital exhibitions. With that, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Santiago. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you, uh, ICOM Pakistan, for the invitation. And uh, ICOM IGMA, my family, uh, dear museum professionals, uh, colleagues, and friends. My presentation today is about uh, developing museum visitors' experience through digital exhibition. What is meant by experience? What does it form? Uh, how does it form? And what are the digital exhibits? what they offer to the visitors and how it could affect the, the visitors' experience. First of all, let me start with the, the exhibition as a means uh, of communication. Uh, museums is where the, the knowledge is shared as a result of communication process that takes place between the visitor and the, the museum, where the cultural message is displayed in uh, the form of exhibition as a visual statement and delivered to the visitors in a form of experience that is transformed after that into a knowledge. Um, the visitor's experience starts with the, the visitor's intention to gain a, a new kind of experience that is differentiated from a, a visitor to another, uh, following their types, ages, uh, interests, uh, motivations, uh, professions, and of course, the purpose of their visit that are some visitors are coming to seeking for enjoyment and other for education. Sometimes they are going to seek some scientific information. So uh, how digital exhibition is transforming the visitors experience? What will happen if we change the, the, the visual statement, how they are displayed? This is our uh, digital the digital exhibition in a world in which the digital and physical dimensions are uh, interwoven. The role of digital uh, technologies within the, the museum context continues to evolve and uh, creates a high expectation to all of us. We have moved from ensuring a digital presence in the exhibition to considering digital spaces equal to physical spaces. Now, content and message are driven by most appropriate presentation method. So if we find that the, the, the digital exhibition are, are better than the physical one, we are going to implement it. Sometimes uh, that method is either uh, digital, but often the, the physical and digital method uh, can be tightly integrated to create uh, some less uh, seamless experience. In, in means, uh, it means that uh, for a museum to meet uh, these increasing demands uh, due to the digital technologies, it should become more creative and innovative to display uh, their collections that has an impact on the, the visitor. So the digital ex exhibition is known in uh, two types. The first one is the, the in-gallery exhibition in which we mean interactive exhibits like uh, film, videos, uh, models, and uh, mechanical interactives uh, exhibits. Uh, the other one is uh, the immersive exhibits like uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, the holograms, in addition to labels, signage, uh, projection mapping, and digital games. Uh, we can find that the, the second type is the, the online exhibition, including the, the websites, social media pages, uh, the museum apps, that displays some stories from the from all the exhibitions. These types of digital exhibits are integrated and overlapped for the museum visitors. 
that are able to provide the, the visitors with an experience that extend beyond the, the museum walls. Uh, what about the digital experience and how it could be done? The digital exhibition is designed to deliver a, a digital experience that can work along with the, the physical experience in a mixed reality world. Uh, it adds to the visitor's experience in a way that physical exhibits cannot do. It tells a story, connects themes across the, the museum, allows the visitors to see what they cannot see otherwise, and uh, contributes to the, the museum's mission. It provides customers customizable and innovative storytelling tool that is never out of date, sustainable and stable, in addition to being as a digital archiving uh, and interacting uh, learning tool that are displayed in different languages. It creates a virtual narratives of engagement that can bring culture heritage into life, in addition to rediscovering the tangible and intangible heritage as a sensory experience. So we can see all the, the pictures and the, uh, all the, the, the walls are um, moving in front of us when they are displayed through creating a small movie when you are uh, moving your mobile phone or the tablet on the wall so you can see that the videos are playing and creating virtual ex exhibitions using laser scanners with more layered interactive content so you can access to what is inside that could be displayed and sent uh, around the, the internet breaking the barriers by making access to the collections in addition to creating a collection that is able to provide a meaningful experience easy to access and able to interact actively with it that the visitor is able to interact with it and gain their own experience so the visitor are able to incorporate the knowledge easily and effectively it's a new paradigm that doesn't separate the digital experience into something different from uh, the all over museum experience. It's the time to shift towards communication projects that are designed to enhance the museum visit through hybrid digital and physical experience by creating a wonderful content that is still making its way to the audience. Thank you very much for listening. It was my honor to be with you today. Thank you. Thank you, Muna, very much. Uh, it's, your presentation was really interesting because it reminds us how the, the digital dim dimension of an exhibition, the digital experience must not be just the replication of the physical experience, but should embrace all the possibilities of this new media that will enhance this experience and create new spaces for dialogue, communication, and interaction. So thank you very much for your excellent presentation, Nora. Thank you, Santiago. <laughs>
or, or only the people that's, that goes to the seat uh, at Alesia? Mm, the, the reactions are very positive from uh, our visitors. And um, I think that for people uh, who, uh, who don't come for the moment are very um, um, curious about all of these uh, devices. So I'm sure that, um, that um, new uh, visitors will come uh, in the Museo Park Alesia because of this kind of uh, devices, of digital devices. It's not just the, the principal reason, but I think that um, uh, our museum is a, a good mix between the archeological collection and the digital devices with fun and the, our name is museo with museum and park with park and some um, to 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 spend a very um, a good moment and to spend uh, to have fun with your family and your friends so i think that our new uh, um, new tour is a, a good mix between this both aspects, and uh, I'm sure that uh, mm -hmm. we will uh, reach new uh, visitors with this, uh, uh, this, uh, this, with this concept. Thank you very much. I also had a question for Dr. Artur, but, but it's also it may be answered for, for to it may be asked to all of you that have worked with digitalization uh, programs in museums. Uh, this kind of initiative require. I imagine a lot of resources, especially in the preservation in the long term of uh, artworks that require, I don't know, um, internet uh, preservation. So how have you been able to deal with this, uh, with this kind of um, challenges? Because it's, 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 yes, because it's difficult, it's expensive, and not everybody's going to be interested. Could you tell us a little bit more about it? <laughs> yeah, sure. Thank you. So this problem hasn't been solved properly yet. Um, people are investigating on this, but for practical purposes, I'm at the moment having a research project on one of the technological artists who was very active in the 60s and 70s, who were using analog photography as a medium. And also he shot, he did a lot of videos in VHS cassettes, Betamax cassettes, if you remember those times. And I've been converting them and digitizing them for almost like six months. And I have a data over like uh, three gigabytes of uh, resources. Uh, luckily, uh, my university has, a, has an agreement with Google and so that we can use their Google Drive resources and they give us an infinite space uh, so that we can uh, stop the files in there. But I think the museums have a, have a role in this because even though everything becomes, everything is becoming decentralized, when, when you're trying to institute, use an institution as a conserv conserver of resources, the museums have to uh, build their own uh, servers. Uh, and this looks like a, a burden on the, the museum's responsibilities and we have to be so quick in taking an action before it gets too late. Because uh, even though, as I said, we are uh, relying on Google Drive resources, it's just a click away. So they, they, we don't have a, a solid uh, agreement between them. So they don't, they have all the right to erase the data. So it's, um, it's delicate uh, line uh, at the moment. But um, as you might have heard, like the crypto technology is also becoming very, uh, quite uh, uh, common. NFTs, non-fungible tokens, but that also comes with some negative re results because there's also a, a huge consumption of energy behind the NFTs. So this problem hasn't been solved yet. As I said, for, for a practical um, example, I'm using cloud technology to, to to save the digitalized versions of the, the media works. But besides that, we, we still do uh, protect and have a physical room to save the negatives and the uh, analog tapes and cassettes uh, with the regular museum standards. Uh, this is uh, still an ongoing question to be answered. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. Uh, I also had a question for Doc. Thank you very much, Doctor. For the, uh, I also had a question for Doctor Mihailova. You told us about the, the some experiences on social media from Russian students that have been successful, but there were there any that weren't as successful uh, that you may, that you thought that were going to work with the public but didn't. So we could learn from your experience. Oh, can you please uh, repeat the question? Yeah, because you you, talk, you were speaking about that, that there were very successful successful uh, propositions from the Russian museums in social media. But yeah. I wanted to ask if there were any that weren't that successful, that any kind of experience that you tried to interact with the public but didn't work or that didn't involve oh, yes. it, did, but it didn't. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for your question. Yes, some of the projects <coughs> had problems with technical support and uh, sometimes internet didn't work well or um, the strategy that was chosen wasn't worked, uh, didn't work very well. For example, when there was a monologue rather than dialogue uh, during live streams and of course uh, <coughs> people in general, they are not really interested in just watching stuff because they're very, very many uh, content uh, right now. So uh, you need to be very specific uh, when choose the right format. Uh, what else? Um, some some museums struggle with promotion on Facebook, but I think it's uh, more about issues with Facebook, which uh, doesn't like uh, nonprofits <laughs> and museums. Uh, Facebook like those companies who pay money to be visible uh, on this platform. Uh, what else? Um, what else? Um, I think, and I see that uh, official texts like press releases or those taken from websites without being adapted for social media, this type of content uh, didn't work well. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dr. Mihailova. <laughs> Is there any, anyone who would like to ask anything for dear panelists? They are, I think uh, they'll be glad to answer you. But there's a last, a last question I would like to ask for uh, Mr. Usakib. These uh, magnificent 3D reconstructions of uh, the heritage in Pakistan that you are using for documentation processes, are, you, uh, are there going to be at any time available to the public to visit or to be seen or, or are you only planning to use them as a conservation strategies. Sir Najam El Sak is mute now, I think. So I think um, that's it. So and uh, we're done with questions i think so <laughs> so <laughs> i just as a conclusion we have seen this excellent presentation of the digital challenges 
reach us in the museums in all our aspects of our work. We've seen that digitization is a tool for the preservation efforts. Digitization is a tool for reaching the publics and uh, digitization is a war as a tool for re rethinking the function of museums as active actors in our societies. But we've also seen that this is not a panacea. Uh, turning digital is not going to fix all our problems, but it actually has given us a new, a completely new space of work. So we now have our physical environments and we now have our digital environments. We have to learn how to work both in the digital, both in the physical, and to mix both realities in a way that we may, as museum professionals, provide a more interesting, interactive, and dialogical space for our publics. If we don't do that, we're not going to be relevant as an institution in the years that, to come. So all these experiences that we have learned in these dramatic pandemic times, we have to turn them in uh, regular practices because we're not, our new normal is not going to be as the old normal. When digital practices were perhaps periphery or secondary, now we have to assume that the work with the digital is central for everyday works, and that's not going to change. So a lot of us are going to have to learn new skills. A lot of us are going to learn, have to learn new, uh, completely new fields of uh, exper expertise, but it's a challenge that we, I think is going to enrich our experience of museum workers, and it's going to develop the way we interact with our publics. So thank you very much for these excellent conferences. It was uh, an honor to participate in this event. And I think uh, we, that's it. I, I wish you well. It's really early in the morning here in Colombia. I think at, at the other side of the Atlantic is already afternoon. So I give you <laughs> my best regards. It was a pleasure to be, to be able to share some time with you. Yeah, thank you. Always an honor to be a part. The same. Igma, thanks to everybody. Thank you Thank very you. much. Thank you all. Thank you. Hey, is the uh, end of the session uh, of the Pakistan uh, and the uh, uh, tomorrow there will be the uh, last session of the uh, group four sessions. Uh, tomorrow there will be a disaster resilient museum presentation we will see uh, see you uh, tomorrow for all we are uh, welcoming if you this session this sessions the last session of the group four sessions and the uh, part one sessions see you tomorrow for the trip and commit session thank you for all for all the valuable and uh, very qualified uh, presentations thank you so much thank you so much see Zahid, you tomorrow yeah Zahid, if you want to say something you can share now no no thank you so much and it's really a wonderful session so hopefully we'll join you tomorrow for the last and the final yeah. session yes. <laughs> thank okay. you so much for uh, icom so, ICM, mr see, so I'll see you tomorrow see you tomorrow <laughs> yes thank you yeah. thank you okay thank you so much